Yeah, we've got two minutes. But yeah. <coughs> Exciting. It's a lively crowd. <laughs> It's set up online, right? Uh, he should be. Um, Brett is monitoring that. Dr. Morgan and um, so I think. Only. Mm -hmm. Hi. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Get started just in a minute or two. Um, thanks everybody for coming. All right, so it's about time. So let me introduce today's speaker and honor the guest. So today's speaker is Nathaniel Prime. He has been with me for the past four years. He has been a leader in the lab, has been initiated many research directions, particularly that one of the techniques we'll talk about today is all under the leadership of NASA. You know, before then we had no such instrument. Then he acquired the instrument, get used to it, and promoted a lot of use and initiated a lot of great collaboration, not only within our group, but also uh, nationally. There's a lot of great we're coming out with him. He has been with me for the past four years, and you can see is well decorated with a lot of owners and publications and conference talks. I want to highlight two of them is, um, has been published in the nanoscale. And look at this beautiful cover for a journal. Amazing, <laughs> um, great job. And he's the one who has learned all these illustrations. And he has great sense of art. <laughs> a lot of science students are so invested in the, in the, in the science part, but they miss out the art. And they don't have a good taste. But then you can see Nathan has a great taste of art as well. <laughs> um, he has published two papers this year related to AFN IR technique. You will hear all about it. And there's two works he has finished, and we are, uh, he has written up the papers, and we are about to send it out. And among those are the first author, and he has another 19 co-author paper. Again, as, as I said at the beginning, thanks to his leadership in using the AFNIR technique. To understand composites material, healthcare material, wearable electronics, composites, um, et cetera, et cetera. And he had given um, six conference talks um, in nationally, American Physical Society, MRS, as well as uh, some ACS meetings. So, um, with that, I want to get this started, Nathan. The floor is yours. All right. All right. Take <clears> it <throat> over. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Gu. And thank you all for attending this dissertation of research. So uh, I tried to memorize this, uh, this title for this talk, but I'll, I'll do my best here. So I want to talk to you today about using AFMIR to study the nanoscopic phase behavior of polymer blends and photovoltaic bulk heterojunctions. So to preface this entire talk, I want everyone to understand that this talk is split into two different sections. The first will focus on uh, enhancing the capabilities and furthering the applications of AFMIR. The second part of the talk will focus on looking at the role of side chain cleavage on the morphology of organic photovoltaics. So in terms of the motivation for this research, it all comes from 
this finding from the Energy Information Administration, which says that we only have just a few generations before we exhaust our known deposits of oil, natural gas, and coal. And so, to, in the interest of national security and, of course, the environment, we want to shift to more uh, sustainable energy sources, such as solar, wind, and hydroelectric power. Now, I'd like to turn your attention to uh, really solar energy and how a lot of research has shifted towards organic photovoltaics. And these have found a lot of application and new products are coming on the market all the time, such as these transparent uh, window solar panels from Solar Window. Additionally, a group in Germany were actually able to integrate organic photovoltaics into park infrastructure uh, to uh, help with public lighting. Of course, this technology is also of great interest to the Department of Defense. Integrating these soft photovoltaic materials into things such as fabrics, such as in, uh, in tents and, and what have you, in order to generate electricity off-grid. Another really, really cool application of organic photovoltaics is the ability, uh, well in this case, this research group found that they could actually create a washable material that had organic photovoltaics integrated into the fabric. And so using this they were actually able to charge a small device from this, from these photovoltaics integrated into this clothing. And so when we say, okay, these are great applications, what are these materials made from? Well, it all goes back to uh, semiconducting polymers, which are very different from the polymers that we experience in everyday life, such as uh, polystyrene, you have your styrofoam cups, you have your bottle caps, your polyethylene terephthalate bottles. But semiconducting polymers all have one thing in common that makes them so powerful, and that's their uh, conjugated backbone, which has an alternating double and single bond. And this allows for the easy flow of electrons along their backbone. That's what gives them the ability to transport an electric charge. So in the context of organic photovoltaics, I want to give you a little bit of background about what a diagram of those might look like. And here in the left hand side, uh, the really where the magic happens in a organic photovoltaic device occurs here where you see red and blue. This is called the photoactive layer. This is what is responsible for actually generating the charge in the photovoltaic device. And when the sunlight hits your photovoltaic device, an exciton is created, which is composed of an electron and an electron hole. When this is generated in the electron polymer donor, shown here in red, this exciton, this whole electron pair, migrates to the interface of the polymer donor polymer electron donor and the small molecule acceptor where the two charges split. The negative charge, the electron, goes toward the cathode and the positive charge goes toward the anode. And so therefore a, a charge is, is, is a, extracted. Now the problem with, with uh, organic photovoltaics currently is that they are highly susceptible to temperature. You know, organic photovoltaics are a lot like a very picky flower that requires just the right soil pH, just the right amount of water, and just the right amount of sunlight in order to actually function. The same can be said for organic photovoltaics. This active layer, the domain size and the domain purity between the electron donor and the electron acceptor, must be very finely tuned in order to generate the maximum amount of charge. And so because it is so susceptible to temperature, when we raise the temperature of the system itself, above the glass transition temperature of the blend, we can get a type of flow of polymer chains in this material. And it generally messes up the morphology, it coarsens it. So it goes from a very high performing organic photovoltaic, but decays rapidly once we get above this glass transition temperature. And this glass transition temperature is the point at which a polymer goes from a very rigid glassy phase to a soft rubbery phase. So ideally we want to raise the glass transition temperature above our, what our operating temperature would be, which is somewhere between 80 and 100 degrees Celsius. And there are a few strategies that we can use to raise the glass transition temperature of these 
materials. The first is through backbone or side chain modification where we can increase the molecular weight or the, the length of our polymer chain, but it reaches a limit. We can only increase the glass transition temperature so far by increasing molecular weight. Secondly, we can increase the backbone unit rigidity. You can think of when you have a stiffer polymer backbone, the polymer chains cannot move around quite so easily. We can also increase the crystallinity of our polymer. And while crystalline materials themselves do not have a glass transition temperature per se, there is what's called a rigid amorphous fraction, which has a higher glass transition temperature than our mobile amorphous fraction. Fra um, fraction. So this does increase the glass transition temperature of our material. We can also look at things such as uh, including hydrogen bonding groups or cross-linking to physically constrain the polymer chains from moving. Of course, we can also do this with, through side chain modification. We can include regioregular side chains, which allows the polymer chain to pack more efficiently. Uh, or, of course, we can inc include cross-linkable side chains and something that is of great interest to our group, thermally cleavable side chains, which allow more efficient packing of our polymer chains. And so these strategies have all been proven in literature. Our own Song Zhang uh, showed that we can increase the glass transition temperature of a polymer electron donor by including very rigid materials, such as these uh, thiophene groups here, or increasing the number of thiophene groups in the polymer backbone, or increasing the fused ring content of the polymer backbone. Another group, also with the last name Zhang, looked at including cross-linkable side chains for a material blend that was photocurable and found that even at high temperatures, there was no dramatic change in the morphology of the material. And lastly, one of the first cases of using thermally cleavable side chains was actually uh, by uh, Lu et al. back in 2004, which included these alkyl side chains here connected to this ester group uh, in a soluble polythiophene precursor. Upon thermal cleavage, these alkyl side chains would come off, leaving only a carboxylic acid, uh, and the resulting polymer was insoluble in solution. So, as we move forward with the talk, I want to go over a few definitions. I keep mentioning morphology, and I will continue mentioning morphology in the future, so I wanted to really define what I mean when I say that. So generally when we're looking at polymer blends, if we consider polymer A to be in blue and polymer B to be in red, when I say domain size, I generally mean we're looking at the diameter of one of the groups. We can look at it two different ways. Either we can look at the diameter uh, in terms of the shape or uh, of the material itself, or we can look at the spacing between domains. That's what I mean when we say domain size. Now when I say domain purity, when we blend two materials, there's not always a very fine interface where you have a pure polymer A and pure polymer B. So when I say domain purity, I'm indicating that there may be a mixture of the two in a very specific region, not 100% polymer A nor 100% polymer B. So there are a few ways that we can quantify both domain size and phase purity. And the first is using X-ray or neutron scattering to, to get the general despacing between materials. However, there are a few drawbacks to this. First, uh, there can be very weak coherent scattering for materials that have very similar electron density, which is often the case for polymer materials. Another downside of using this technique is it, it limits your perception of the blend to an averaged representation of the morphology. So you're looking at the whole picture instead of on the nanoscale. You're limited to the micron scale quite often. Another technique used to probe the morphology of polymer blends is scanning probe microscopy, where we raster a probe across the surface, almost like as if it's a braille technique. So we are able to map out the height and the valleys of various morphologies. And these can be paired with other techniques, such as infrared spectroscopy, which we will look at later, or Raman spectroscopy. However, when we 
look at the downfall of this technique, there can be very poor contrast for materials with very similar mechanical properties. And if you're using another a secondary technique, such as Raman spectroscopy, it may require some theoretical models to actually correctly interpret your data. And so we recently, and I mean recently, within the last five to six years, acquired what's called AFMIR, which stands for Atomic Force Microscopy paired with infrared spectroscopy. Now this is a scanning probe technique. So this means that we are rastering a probe across the surface. At the same time, we are also shining a pulsed infrared tunable laser at the material under the probe. And this creates rapid thermal expansion in the material if it responds at that particular wavelength. And so what I've shown here on the right hand side, on the top, Sorry, my laser uh, pointer is not working. Right here, we have our height image of a block copolymer composed of one block of polystyrene and another block of uh, PMMA. And what we can do is we can tune into this resonance bond here at 1732 inverse wave number and this peak right here at 1492 to highlight the polystyrene. And you can see those resulting images in red and green, they are inverse of each other. We can perform an overlay of these two materials and we can very precisely map out which materials map out which domain. And though, so this is very superior to just basic atomic force microscopy or other scanning probe techniques. Now what makes the AFMIR so special is the actual laser that is used to excite this material thermally. As I said before, when the laser hits the material, if you are tuned in to the exact resonant frequency of this material, it responds quite rapidly. And there are two different phases in which this laser pulse is divided. In the first part, the laser turns on, and this is a very fast process, but the laser turns on and we get rapid thermal expansion, uh, rapid change in volume, until we reach the end of the pulse, and that's where we get the maximum amount of expansion, is near the end of the on pulse. The laser turns off, and we get a uh, reduction in the volume of the material underneath the probe, where the, uh, where the thermal energy is diffused outward. And so we take advantage of we take advantage of the laser's properties in order to tune uh, and see exactly what we want. So a few applications of AFMIR, it has been used extensively uh, in literature. One of, the, one of the cool, I'll name a few cool applications of AFMIR. This group, uh, Cleed et al, actually correlated AFMIR, uh, AFMIR analysis to fluorescence analysis when they were looking at a breast cancer cell. And in this height image shown here. Here's the breast cancer cell. When, we use a, when they use AFMIR to target a very specific domain of the cancer cell, they found that it was in a much tighter domain than when they looked at that same domain using fluorescence analysis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Additionally, the same group looked at the composition of electrospun nanofibers where due to the shift in the uh, resonant wavelength of crystalline materials versus amorphous materials, they were able to determine that there was a si significant amount of amorphous material in the outer shell of these fibers while the internal core of the fibers was highly crystalline. Additionally, and something closer to our own research, is another group, Gong et al, looked at the uh, domain size and composition of a blend of an electron donor and an electron acceptor. Areas highlighted here in red are in high composition of the polymer electron donor, and areas in the second image highlighted in red are of the electron acceptor. So this is very close to our own research. So I want to go over a technique that we will use later in this talk. And the first is isotope labeling. Now isotope labeling has been used extensively in the field of nuclear magnetic resonance and other, uh, other areas where labeling is required, such as in neutron scattering. 
Now, the important uh, critical aspect of this is when we change the mass of one of the atoms, when we go from a hydrogen to a deuterium, when we increase the mass of an atom, it increases the frequency at which this bond vibrates. And every bond has a unique resonant frequency. And so this helps us overcome a lot of challenges when it comes to AFMIR, when we have materials that have overlapping, uh, uh, overlapping infrared um, resonant responses. And so Rickard et al. actually used this principle when he blended polyethylene and polypropylene in a blend with a with a block copolymer of the two. So it was polyethylene block polypropylene. And he was wondering which phase do the, does the copolymer prefer, polyethylene or polypropylene? And so he used deuterium labeling for the copolymer and he was able to tune in to this carbon deuterium bond here at about 2200 and he observed this single signal uh, only in the polyethylene phase right here in this light area. So this is one of the first examples of using isotope labeling in conjunction with AFM-IR. Now, as we move on with this talk, I will, I will often speak about composition analysis, and I wanted to go through how we generally do that, um, not only in my research, but in research that has been done using a Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Now, when we look at the composition of materials, we first need to generate what's called a calibration curve. This is done by preparing solutions of varying concentrations. In this case, I chose between 10 and 50 milligrams per milliliter. And then we measured their absorbance as a function of concentration. And hopefully, ideally, this would create a linear curve. We can extract the slope of this curve and then measure the absorbance of materials with unknown concentration, compare it to our calibration curve, and get the exact composition. Now this is all backed by the Beer-Lambert law, which directly relates absorbance being proportional to concentration. And so I saw this and I said, well, can we apply it to AFM-IR, which has never been done at this point, or had never been done up to this point. So in terms of an overview of my research, we really look at three different areas. Processing in terms of blend optimization through annealing temperature and annealing time, as well as changing the structure of our materials to fit our needs in terms of targeted moieties such as isotope labeling and cleavable side chains, which have a unique resonant frequency. And then measuring their properties in terms of the morphology composition, or I should say surface composition, in terms of domain size and domain purity. And when we look at this full picture, in the end, we're going to look at the performance stability and efficiency of devices that we will make from these materials. So that's the roadmap that we were looking at. And so for the first project, we wanted to answer a few questions. Can we gather quantitative data from AFMIR? And can we expand compositional analysis of these materials to more than just a blend of two materials? And so for blend number one, we chose a binary system composed of isotope labeled or deuterated polystyrene and a very a widely used conjugated polymer, P3HT. For the second blend system, we blended three different materials. Again, we use isotope or deuterated polystyrene, polylactic acid, which is a well-known biodegradable polymer, and polycarbonate. And so first, when we blended these two, we needed to first create a calibration curve. And here's an example of what we, of what we did for, uh, uh, for solutions with varying concentrations. This is of, of the one-to-one -one blended film of deuterated polystyrene and P3HT. We chose this peak here at around 1500, which corresponded to our, uh, a few carbon hydrogen bonds located on our P3HT. And we chose this peak here at around 2200, corresponding to our carbon deuterium bond. We then uh, looked at, uh, calculated the ratio of these two, and we created a composition curve, where we looked at the peak area ratio of DPS over P3HT as a function of, deuterated, of known deuterated polystyrene composition. So then, 
And here is actually where that value, the ratio of that value comes up right there in the middle. So then we applied this calibration curve to the three blends. Uh, one to three blend, a one to one blend, and a three to one blend of deuterated polystyrene and P3HT. Here we have our height images of the binary blend where you can see that the continuous phase in the one to three blend uh, is very, very dark. This will later be proven to be the P3HT phase. And this is shown here where we can see areas highlighted in red are responding to the wavelength of 2200 for deuterated polystyrene. And so in each image highlighted in red, these are areas that experience rapid thermal expansion in response, in response to the laser that's tuned at 2200 inverse centimeters. Now, I took a line scan across the domain of these materials here, here, and here calculated those compositions and calculated the composition for each of those points. And this is what we observe here, is that as we across the domain from P3HT domain into DPS, we get a rapid increase in the composition of deuterated polystyrene. We find that there is only there is no deuterated polystyrene in the P3HT domain, but there seems to be there seems to exist a mix of the two at the actual domain at the interface of the two materials until reaching around 80% deuterated polystyrene in the deuterated polystyrene phase. And this is what we saw for all three of our blends. You can see how this composition rapidly changes for the three to one blend. And so then we ask the question, okay, well great, what about for ternary blends? So this is where the importance of using an isotope label material really comes in. So we blended those three different materials together, deuterated polystyrene, polylactic acid, and polycarbonate, and we scanned at the resonant wavelength for deuterated polystyrene. And this is what we observed. Areas highlighted in very, very light blue are areas that are, should be in high concentration of deuterated polystyrene. If we scan for PLA, everywhere highlighted in bright pink are the areas with the most intensity, um, indicate areas of high PLA concentration. This was collected at 1,760 inverse centimeters. And then you can see that when we scan for polycarbonate, we get the inverse image of our deuterated polystyrene scan. And here is exactly where we scanned for those materials. We used uh, 2194 to observe the DPS domains. We looked at 1,700 60 to observe the PLA domains, and then we chose this one right here, this, um, this peak at 1502, to observe the polycarbonate domains. And so here is the topography, or the height image of the two, and it was time to calculate composition of each of these points. And so we collected three broadband spectrum, a spectra at these points, one, two, and three. And this resulted in three different spectra with three very different compositions. And so if we scan right here for number one, which correlates to uh, should be high content of deuterated polystyrene, we find that it's 100% deuterated polystyrene at that area, 0% other material. However, if we scan at location two, which shows a high concentration of PLA, that resulted in a concentration of only 3% deuterated polystyrene, 28% polycarbonate, and 69% PLA, so it was dominant PLA. We again measured at 0.3, shown right here, which showed high, uh, high correlation with polycarbonate located in this domain, and we found that this area was 22% deuterated polystyrene, 40% polycarbonate, so dominant polycarbonate, um, but the close runner-up was actually PLA at 38%. And so, in conclusion, we found that using isotope labeling, we could sufficiently shift these IR absorption peaks to, to fit our need and actually calculate composition from this. We found that the Beer-Lambert law was effective in AFMIR as well as FTIR. And, of course, AFMIR allows a more holistic visualization of the morphology of these, domain size, of these domains and their domain purity. So, shifting over, when we look at project two, we asked a few questions. And that was, well, 
we've learned so much about AFMIR, but how deep is it actually seeing into our, into our samples? And so we got the idea of preparing a bilayer sample where we would choose a bottom layer that had a very well-defined pattern that we, could easily, that we could easily distinguish. And then on top of this, we would place a, uh, a barrier layer, uh, not a sacrificial layer, but a barrier layer um, that should prevent any kind of absorption from happening, but we later found out that's not, that's not the case at all. So our key questions were, what is the depth of probing for AFMIR, and what factors can be tuned to control this depth of probing? And so to prepare this bilayer sample, we looked at two different materials. We created this very uh, well-defined pattern using a blend of polystyrene and PLA. Onto, and we spun cast this onto our silicon wafer. We'll denote it silicon wafer one. We spin coated it. Onto a second silicon wafer, we applied a sacrificial water soluble layer followed by a layer of polystyrene. Now this layer of polystyrene could be tuned to various thicknesses depending on the concentration of polystyrene that we use in solution. We then would dip the silicon wafer that contained the sacrificial water soluble layer, in, layer into a bath of deionized de water which allowed the polystyrene layer to float on the surface. We then took uh, the first wafer that contained our well-defined, well-patterned uh, domain and picked up that second layer with that material. And this created a sample that had a very, very, uh, very, very sharp interface between the bottom layer and the top layer. And so for our bottom layer, we prepared a solution for this material that, that resulted in a film to be about 90 nanometers thick, where our polystyrene barrier solution, it varied between 20 and over 100 nanometers. Here is an example uh, of a sample with the uh, barrier layer being only between 20 and 30 nanometers. And if I can point your attention to this peak here at 1760, this area shown in green is on the barrier layer and the red peaks here at 1760 are off the barrier layer. This is the result of a line scan done here. So we can see that even with a barrier layer of 20 to 30 nanometers, we can still easily observe the PLA uh, showing up here in the AFMIR spectra. So this is better visualized in uh, observing the AFMIR signals as a function of wave number for uh, films that have various thicknesses when it comes to their barrier layer. So these thicknesses were ranging from 28.3 nanometers all the way up to 105 nanometers and we can see that as we move down from no barrier at all to 105 nanometers there is a significant drop in the AFMIR signal. We plotted this AFMIR signal at 1762 as a function of probing depth, and we saw a near linear decrease in the signal. Now, I'm sure you're all very anxious to see some AFMIR images. So what does that look like in application? So the first image here is no barrier layer. This is the pattern that we were, that we were looking for. We were trying to observe these PLA dom domains shown here in red. As we increase uh, barrier layer thickness, we can see a gradual disappearance of these PLA domains until we reach a thickness layer of about 105 nanometers, where it's more um, difficult to visualize or distinguish the difference between the PLA and the polystyrene domains. And so we thought, great, we saw a few uh, pretty pictures. Now, how can we actually control this? And so we looked at three different factors. We first examined what effect does laser power have on the subsurface sensitivity. And so in this case, we looked at three different, we actually looked at more um, laser power, but in this case, we plotted 10 to 40% laser power. Um, and here are the AFMIR one-dimensional spectra where we're focusing on this region here for 1760. We can see a gradual decrease in the area at 1760 as we decrease laser power from 40% down to 10%. Now, what we decided to do was plot the signal ratio of PLA to polystyrene as a function of laser power. And we saw that around 25% 
laser power, we see a dramatic increase in this ratio value. Now, why did I use a ratio value at all? Well, there is something called a thickness effect, where is if you increase the thickness of your sample, you get an increase in AFMIR signal. And so to account for the changing thickness of our polystyrene layer, we decided to take the ratio of PLA over polystyrene to account for that. Another factor that we looked at was laser pulse width, where we varied the laser pulse width measured in terms of nanoseconds. This is the duration of your laser pulse. We varied this between 60 and 200 nanoseconds, which 200 nanoseconds is our maximum value that we can achieve. And here are the resulting AFMIR spectra, where again our attention should be drawn to this, uh, this signal here at 1760, where 200 nanoseconds resulted in the highest signal. Again, if, if we plot the ratio of PLA to polystyrene, we can see a almost immediate uh, increase in the ratio value as a function of pulse width. The last factor that we looked at was looking at laser pulse frequency or the time duration between laser pulses, varying it between 355 kilohertz all the way up to 1280 kilohertz. And in this we found something interesting, that as we increase laser pulse frequency, we found a near linear decrease in this value of PLA to polystyrene. So the faster that we pulse the laser, the more surface sensitive that we are becoming. And so, or at least so we thought. So to prove this, we took a height image scan on top of our barrier layer. And here's a nice little target where we took our AFMIR uh, one-dimensional spectra. And we turned the laser pulse width to 60 nanoseconds. So very, very low. The duration of the pulse is very, very low. We tuned into the resonance absorption band of the PLA and then scanned. Well, all we get is noise here in the AFMIR spectra. However, when we examine the one-dimensional spectra, we can see there is no PLA signal to notice. However, we can very easily distinguish these peaks correlating to polystyrene, which showed that we were surface sensitive, that we weren't, weren't detecting any PLA and only the surface. So then we switched. All we did was change the laser pulse from 60 nanoseconds to 200 nanoseconds, and all of a sudden we can very easily see this pattern. And so this is for a barrier layer of about 50 uh, nanometers. And we can see the apparent change in this signal right here, where the peak at 1760 is very easily distinguished. And th so this showed we can control the, uh, the depth of probing for AFMIR. And so, in conclusion for that project, we found that AFMIR is capable of probing subsurface morphology up to and beyond 100 nanometers. We found that subsurface signal is near proportional to laser power and laser pulse width, while being uh, inversely proportional to laser pulse frequency. And we found that we could achieve surface sensitive AFMIR by reducing laser pulse width while maintaining laser power. So now we're ready for the second part of the talk. I know this is, this is project three, but this is the second part of the talk. We're actually talking about conjugated polymers now. So one idea that we had in conjunction with Professor Wei Yu and Jordan Shanahan of the University, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill was what if we took a blend intended for organic photovoltaics and we installed thermally cleavable side chains onto the backbone of the polymer donor. We could optimize the morphology at a relatively low temperature through uh, very careful thermal annealing and selecting the right uh, thermal annealing time. And then at the very last minute, lock in this morphology by completely thermally cleaving off the chains to leave an insoluble material that should perform or hopefully perform uh, better than the soluble material. And so, uh, Professor Wei Yu uh, from UNC and Jordan Shanahan, they synthesized this material, P3ET, -E which contained these cleavable uh, alkyl side chains. And at around 140 degrees Celsius, these side chains could be cleaved off and they essentially go into atmosphere, they volatilize off, leaving a carboxylic acid. So in this, our key questions for this research were, what effect does side chain cleavage have on the blend morphology? 
And does side chain cleavage effectively lock in the morphology, or does it shift over time? And so we took P3ET and we blended it with a known small molecule electron acceptor, which has been used extensively in the OPV community, PCBM. And so we, we used uh, the uh, TGA, thermogravimetric analysis, to actually examine the efficiency of alkyl side chain removal as a function of annealing time at 140 degrees Celsius. And what we found is by incorporating PCBM into a blend with P3T, the efficiency of alkyl side chain cleavage uh, rapidly uh, reduced. So at around 10 hours, pure P3T uh, there was 83% cleavage. 83% of the side chains had been cleaved. However, if we include PCBM, only 55% of the side chains had been cleaved, meaning that PCBM has a uh, thermal stability effect on the material blend. However, if we increase the temperature to 200 degrees Celsius, the efficiency is uh, essentially the same. Uh, we reach around 80% side chain cleavage in just a few minutes, five to 10 minutes. So, we began to analyze the morphology using our beloved AFMIR. Um, here is a height image of our blend shown here and a little chevron showing where we, t where we collected a AFMIR spectra. We tuned in to the, uh, to the unique resonance wavelength of uncleaved P3ET and we found that there was a resonance difference between uncleaved P3ET and cleaved P3ET. And so here are the the locations on where we scanned, we scanned at 1708 for the uncleaved P3ET and at 1738 for PCBM. And generally, we get a mm, I'd relatively smooth uh, film here just for ASCAS. If we anneal it at 140 degrees Celsius for about 10 hours, uh, which should be between 50 and 80 percent a side chain cleavage, we begin to see these pill-like crystalline formations beginning to occur in the height in the AFMIR image, and these were confirmed to be P3T beginning to crystallize. Now, this is, this is something that we don't want. This is, this is bad for device performance. And so here are the areas where we, where we scan once again. Uh, so we said, okay, well, 140 degrees Celsius is far too low. We should go to higher temperatures. What about 200 degrees Celsius? So we annealed this same sample starting from the ASCAS material at 200 degrees Celsius for only five minutes. And what becomes immediate apparent are these holes that form, which are signs of de-wetting. So we can see a loss of our uncleaved P3T here shown in, in green. And we said, okay, well obviously this is a Goldilocks situation because uh, if we anneal at too low of a temperature, we get undesired crystallinity. If we anneal at too high of a temperature, we get signs of de-wetting. We don't want that. So we decided to anneal uh, our ASCAS samples at temperatures ranging between uh, 160 degrees Celsius and 180 degrees Celsius, trying to find those Goldilocks, that Goldilocks uh, situation there or uh, conditions. We annealed uh, these samples at 160 degrees Celsius for times ranging between 5 and 60 minutes. And here's an example of the one uh, of the sample annealed for 40 minutes here. We can see there's no kind of there's no kind of de-wetting occurring, but it does differ slightly from the ASCAS material where we see these domains occurring which indicate presence of PCBM. However, we don't see significant uh, cleavage of the material because there is not a shift between 1708 inverse centimeters down to 1688 inverse centimeters. However, if we in, uh, increase the temperature at, to 107 degrees Celsius and anneal at the exact same temperatures, we begin to see these, these uh, volcanic, I'm going to call them volcanic walls occurring, where these edges are beginning to raise up with a concave center, indicating the presence of that de-wetting is occurring. And this is after annealing for 40 minutes. And we can see that this, um, that the um, <coughs> the resonance peak at 1788 has shifted down to 1688, which is in indicative of thermal cleavage. Now, 
now we found that 180 degrees was still was far too high. We, if we had already seen signs of de-wetting at 170 degrees Celsius for 40 minutes, we begin to see definite apparent signs of de-wetting uh, when annealing at 180 degrees Celsius. And so we needed a candidate. What blend and what conditions do we use, what sample and what conditions do we use to pick as our Goldilocks to pick the sample that we're going to lock in, essentially. So we chose 160 degrees Celsius for 40 minutes. So here are, a height, here are the height images and an AFMIR image showing uh, the presence of uncleaved P3T on the surface. If we anneal this at 160 degrees Celsius for 40 minutes, we don't see any uh, really de-wetting occurring. And here we're now actually uh, highlighting the areas of cleaved P3ET. And then we attempt to lock in this morphology by annealing at 220 degrees Celsius for just five minutes. And this should show complete thermal cleavage of the polymer side chains. And we can see this morphology here where we see a variation in the composition of the cleaved P3ET and the shared morphology with the PCBM. So then we said, okay, now that we have supposedly locked in this morphology, we need to test it. So let's bring it up to a temperature that is, uh, which should, should be extreme operational temperatures. And so we decided to anneal our, um, our locked in sample at 100 degrees Celsius, which is the upper operating range of an organic solar cell. And so at 100 degrees Celsius, after 24 hours, we begin to see immediate de-wetting. Um, not very good, uh, you're not going to get very good performance from that, um, but we still continued the experiment to see if the morphology changed. And so what we found is that after one week of annealing, two weeks of annealing, or three weeks, and four weeks of annealing, the height and topography did not change as it probably had reached its equilibrium state. Uh, and we did not see a significant change in morphology across the AFMIR images where we're highlighting areas of um, cleaved P3ET. I will say that there is a, uh, a small and uh, slight difference between the AFMIR spectra for each of these components, and that is because on, based on where you place your probe, you may get variations in composition, so they all won't be exactly the same. So then it was time to actually look at the performance of our devices. And so we had our sample first anneal at 200 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. This is just simple as cast and then cleaved. Then we took our sample, annealed it, prepared it at 160 degrees Celsius for 40 minutes, followed by thermal cleavage. Then we did this and we aged it for 24 hours at 100 degrees Celsius. And then another sample, we aged it at 100 degrees Celsius for 72 hours. And what we found, we examined the open circuit voltage and we looked at the power conversion efficiency of devices prepared using these, uh, using these conditions. And what we found is that the open circuit voltage did not drastically change over time. And open circuit voltage is based on the intrinsic properties of the materials themselves. Now the power conversion efficiency, we found that it remained relatively constant for the sample simply locked in and even after, uh, after optimizing the morphology and after annealing it remained uh, the same. However, once we aged it at 100 degrees Celsius for, uh, for 24 hours and after 72 hours, we began to see an increase in the performance. Um, so this, this work is still ongoing. We've actually shifted from using P3T to a new uh, higher performance material, uh, which should show uh, higher uh, side chain thermal cl uh, cleavage efficiency and avoid that de-wetting problem. And so with that, what we concluded was cleavable side chains do allow for the tunable glass transition temperature of these conjugated polymer blends. And the desired morphology can be effectively locked in upon side chain cleavage. Uh, however, side chain cleavage um, doesn't uh, significantly affect performance of the device. However, it does provide short term morphological stability. And so in terms of concluding remarks, in, in the first phase of the project, we looked at expanding the capabilities and applications of AFMIR. We de successfully developed a method to characterize blend composition and detect subsurface chemical domains. And we looked 
and illuminate the effect of side chain cleavage on the morphology of conjugated polymer blends. We found that side chain cleavage increases the TG, stabilizes the morphology short term, but has little device, has little effect on device performance. Now, I, I would like to give a few honorable mentions to the few collaborative works um, that I've had the honor of, of uh, the groups that I've been honored to work with in the past, uh, including works in Nature, where we were looking at stretchable all polymer LEDs and examining the morphology of those blends, uh, as well as in, in improving the efficiency of various OPV devices um, and looking at the morphology of elastic and multifunctional polymer electronics and uh, semiconductors. With that, I'd like to thank my, my committee, Professor Gu, Dr. Morgan, Dr. Patton, Dr. Nazarenko, and uh, Dr. Wiggins, as well as all faculty staff, my own research group. Uh, Y'all have been great over the last uh, five years. Um, of course, my friends, my friends, family, uh, my church family, and of course, God for, for helping me make it through these, these uh, last five years. Um, a few, a few uh, another few little mentions, but I've also been incredibly grateful for the, uh, for the travel opportunities that this group has afforded me. This is a, a little trip that how you and I took to uh, MRS conference in San Francisco, how you and I went to, went to prison together. Uh, it was really great. Um, and of course, uh, a trip that we all remember, a trip to Honolulu for MRS 2022. That was really fun. Um, Gurong there with a pineapple. He, he loved his fruit. Um, force feeding me pineapple occasionally. That was, that was very funny, but anyway. So with that, I'd like to take any of your questions. <laughs> That's hot science <laughs> right there. In addition to the hot weather outside, yep. right? Mm -hmm. uh, any question from Stephen first? <laughs> Enjoying the relaxing summer? <laughs> okay, let's open up to faculties as well. Any question from faculty for Nathan? I'll just ask you one question. Okay. So in your second project, um, is the thickness of the film limited to when this would be applicable to try to uh, get the chains out of the film? The second project, you mean for the thermally cleavable? Yeah. The thermally cleavable work. Um, yes, that would have an effect because you have, as you heat the material, you have side chains attempting to, to cleave off in the center. And obviously, if you have too thick of a sample, there's going to be a, a temperature variation between the center of the material and the, and the actual surface. And so um, probably by limiting the thickness to a near uh, 2D plane, um, you, you would avoid that issue. But you also might run into some de-wetting issues as you decrease the thickness of your, of your film. So how thick were the films that you measured? Excuse me? How thick were the films that you produced on which you showed um, Between 80 and 120 nanometers. Thank you. Dr. Patton. So on the project where you're looking for uh, at uh, depth sensitivity, Maybe I'm thinking about it in the wrong way, but is is there a role that, um, and maybe this is not the parameter, but is there a role that thermal expansion uh, coefficients of the polymer play in the depth sensitivity, sensitivity that you would see in those systems? That's definitely something that I, that I consider when we first started this project because it, it should be very material dependent depending on uh, how much heat the material is capable of absorbing or how easily diffusible the material is. And so it is very material dependent, but we haven't proven that yet. We haven't shown that. Uh, you have to do a number of other materials to, to see. Right. And one other related question in, in that vein is, is there any uh, hysteresis? Um, and again, maybe I'm thinking about it the wrong way, but you have thermal expansion and, and attraction. Is there any hysteresis that would be uh, observed if you were monitoring the same line scan, for example? Uh, yes, I think I actually, I have, I have no way to prove this, but I think that I did run into some hysteresis where 
not all of the heat has completely diffused out of the system before the laser hits it again and heat can build up in the system and we have shown that it can melt some of our samples um, because you're pulsing at uh, 1200 kilohertz between 355 and 1200 kilohertz and it's very possible to build up a lot of heat very very quickly but I can't I don't have the data to prove that I've just that's just what I've observed Dr. McCormick. Uh, and George, your center, I like, like the way you had the one mass and presented it. I know very little about this area, but when you put up slide 20, I think it's the illustration of something very important for all the science is the compatibility of lens versus, I want to ask you about slide 20. The compatibility of taking those same monitors, say they're an AB. ABA or BAB travelog, maybe ABC, where I can make schizophrenic problems. We can easily do that where I can change morphology for solution. We can do that easily by taking charges. And so we can go from one morphology to another. And uh, Stacey York did some work with this. And, and for some people pressing it, did a lot of the X-ray diffraction on it to show the different morphologies. And mm -hmm. Our followers came in trying to make a follower that we can change the temperature and take a growth, uh, be able to grow nerve cells within that tissue. These are very soft materials. Mm -hmm. and I know that, so what would happen if you were able to get a material to be schizophrenic here where I could go between one kind of structure and another by thermal treatment or by some other treatment now, when I see the same thing, for instance, if my cells turn inside out, and I have now the core outside, do you know if people have done that? Or is it, and studied, made, used these kinds of studies before? I know. Because you can't make the deuterated versions of monomers that, and I know Brad Locust has been very interested in this, and I was just curious if anybody mm -hmm. done that, or would it be of value here, or when you go to your experiment, or you're just going to be wiped out because the temperature is going to, going to wipe out your signal. I know that AFMIR has been used extensively to look at the core of uh, coded materials um, in terms of drug delivery systems. Uh, it has found extensive use for that. Now, in, in terms of materials that um, uh, you know invert, uh, like like what you say, they would found they would find a lot of good use of this this technique to characterize those. Um, because generally for those, say like for a, um, like a drug loaded nanoparticle, something like that, you could use this technique to um, examine the surface and then also examine the core. So there's a lot of application for this tool there as well, depending on the thickness of, the, of that core the, the or other, shell. The other thing that, that I wonder about is there's so much work that's been done and some work here uh, with layer by layer approaches of putting things down uh, and you know, layer kind of uh, layer very well controlled polymers. Mm -hmm. Dr. Morgan did some early work for some of the students we did when we first got the AFM here. And it's very interesting because there was a lot of diffusion control as you put the two layers down and we were doing an exchange between an anion and polymer and mm -hmm. polymer. So the first student came back and they were really excited about the special morphology that we were seeing there. It turns out it is the polymer, which was a sodium salt and a sulfonate polymer, and the cat and the chloride, ammonium chloride of the cationic polymer were laid down one by one. Mm -hmm. As that, as those layers could be used together, an ion exchange occurred. Soft crystals <laughs> developed, and mm -hmm. so you had this morphology around these little cubes, which right. was really interesting. But of course, we didn't know at that time what was going on. It took us a while to figure it out. But it seems like a lot of layer by layer things thickness of the layers that you talked about are extremely important to these devices to make them work. It, it, so the thickness of those layers and the morphology of those layers has got to be important. I just wondered if anybody's done that with like polyamphalites or whether I'm involved. I, I know in terms of like uh, laminate structures and things like that, some people have looked at um, the, layer, the layer of a poly polyethylene terephthalate uh, bottle which has multiple 
different layers in that for different structure, uh, like to prevent degassing or anything like that. And people have like microtomed that and placed it on AFMIR and examined each of like say seven layers that are contained within that small wall of a like a Coke bottle, something like that. So the same, I I, I would love to do that is take like a like an OPV device. Um, allow it to age thermally or have it under operating temperatures and then microtome it and then examine the interface between all those materials to actually quantify like migration of material. So say if you had like a small molecule acceptor, watch its migration through the, uh, through the material. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Charlie. Any other questions before we close out the public session? Well, if no more, then let's congrats, Nathan, for the presentation. Okay, we have the next the session will be a closed session between the committee members. So for those who are not on the committee, I would Thank ask you. you to temporarily leave the auditorium. And Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Great job. Great job. That's right. Yeah. Andrew. <laughs> hey, buddy. Hey. Good job. Hey, Sean. All right. All right. Good work. Thank right. you. Good job, bro. Yeah, thanks. Hey. Congratulations. Thank it's you. way over my head. It was awesome. <laughs> way over mine too, but it was good anyway. <laughs> I loved you. I'm glad you are able to make it. You did a great job, baby. Thank you. Awesome job. Thank you. Awesome job. I'll see y'all soon. Yeah, see you soon. Good night. Daniel, congrats. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hey, buddy. Thanks. Nice job. Thanks. Yeah. Brother Craft. Incredible. <laughs> and I did enjoy it. Incredible. <laughs> I'll see y'all soon. Wow. I love you. I love you. Mm -hmm. I love it. it was fascinating. Thank you. Interesting. Wow. What a research.